my hometown, welcome to Liverpool. And so I have a quotation from a, a youth project worker who tells me that reading, reading to children, to young people with guns, made me think how important imagination is for the young people as well as physical stuff. We need the poetry. It can help you understand things. It's like the power to think ahead. We've got to give this to the young people. My own experience, um, I come f from a very um, messy, what would now be called dysfunctional family. I was the oldest child um, in a family where my mother was single and becoming an alcoholic. I wasn't attending school very much, I was truant. Um, but I was a reader and um, I read all kinds of things, things I didn't understand, things very, very easy, cheap things, anything really. I don't want to make myself sound like a highbrow teenager. I also was reading Heidi or um, uh, V.S. Nepal's House for Mr. Biz was. Um, I, can't, I can remember lots of things from that time. Iris Murdoch, I don't think I understood a word of, of any of that. Later in my teens, I began to read um, Doris Lessing. While I was at university, or just before I went, I can't quite be sure of the chronology, uh, Doris Lessing brought out an, a sci-fi novel called Shikasta. And it posits the idea that there is a universe in which giant empires control the evolution of planets and bring life into being. And one of those empires is Canopus, and it is growing a, a planet which is Earth. There was a point when suddenly it seemed as if our brains grew. Um, really quite remarkably, and at the same time language came, or did, are they interconnected? So her novel is based on the idea that those things are not accidents, they, they've happened, we've been brought on. And I think the thing that got me about it when I read it, and I'd be maybe 24 or five, was the feeling that it put an enormous burden of responsibility on, on anybody to think, I am here, is there a purpose? Um, should I be doing something? Which is a very old-fashioned kind of possible thought, or certainly I'd never thought it before. I just was wandering happily through my life, eating and drinking, smoking drugs, T not being serious about, you know. But suddenly I thought, even though it's a, it's a novel, something about that is true, that the... There are people, it could be like the lady who crosses you over the street on your way to school, who do good things for you or change the course of your life in various ways. So perhaps all humans have some unknown to them responsibility. And I found that very, very frightening. And I couldn't really go out of the house. I was too scared to <laughs> make a terrible mistake or do something wrong. And so I wrote to Doris Lessing and said, mm, you, you've really frightened me now, I'm really scared. What if everything's this serious? And, uh, and so, what shall I do? And she wrote back saying, look, for God's sake, pull yourself together. Um, grow up, be, be serious, read books. So I uh, obediently have done that. So is there a book that has changed your life? Yeah, it's that. Did I t have a purpose? Was it the reading revolution? Who, who knew? I don't know, but lots of other things have fed into to it. You know, I needed to have been that unhappy kid. That was part of it. I needed to meet my husband and get sensible. That was part of it. So the book takes its place amongst a whole constellation of loads of stuff that may made life turn out like this. This is the first group I set up of Get Into Reading in England. This is in a poor part of, of um, Liverpool. And at this time I worked at the University of Liverpool as a, a teacher of literature. 
And um, there was a, I think it's about 2001, we had some special money in the university for developing outreach projects. And I applied to that and got some money to set up this for five weeks. So here I am 10, 11 years later um, with 350 such groups happening every week in England and, and many more spreading in Denmark, here in Belgium, in Australia. And we've trained six, 700 people now to develop groups like this. Um, they meet every week, we read aloud, and we talk to each other. It's very, very simple. It's not complicated. I was very unhappy when I went to university, and I nearly left all the way through year one and year two. I was always on the edge of leaving. And then in, in the third year, um, my tutor was Brian Nellist. Uh, he doesn't have a, an academic professional. He's not a professor. <clears throat> he should have been. He is a, the greatest teacher, but he was terribly posh. And I was afraid, oh, well, I've got this teacher. But as soon as I sat down with him and he starts to read, he loved it so much. And he was really interested to know what you thought. And it was as if he didn't come with any set things you needed to think. You could think anything. And so I remember reading a, a poem by W.B. Yeats, Dialogue of Self and Soul, which ha I won't be able to remember the lines probably, but it's something like, he's looking back over his life and he's remembering the ignominy of boyhood, the pain of boyhood melting into man. It goes down the page and it comes to, he, I am content to measure the lot, forgive myself the lot. And at that point, I thought uh, of my father, who I just thought would always forgive himself. Right? He would forgive himself. Whatever he did, he'd forgive himself. And I said out loud, oh, that's just like my dad. That's not the kind of thing you could say at university, but Brian received it in the spirit of she's thinking you know she, something is happening so that was the beginning of that and he taught me to always respect the text in the sense that it's like meeting a person so you you don't meet it with prejudice all right it's it's a religious poem of the 17th century don't be prejudiced against it try and love it um, as you would with any human. It is like a human thing. It maybe is human. Um, it's what we can do. So he taught me to, to respect it, to be open towards them, and then to try to, to understand it, and I think also then to use it to understand myself, though he might dispute that. Um, not quite sure. If a person cannot think with his thoughts. That is to say, he has thoughts, which we all do, but lacks the apparatus of thinking, which enables him to use his thoughts, to think them, as it were, then the personality is incapable of learning from experience. And that's what we are here for. We are here to learn from our experience. Reading has helped me in understanding my life, mm, yes, in lots of ways. And um, I could give some serious examples or some sort of almost silly ones. So um, there's, in English, there's a, po a poet, uh, 17th century religious poet, metaphysical poet called George Herbert. Um, I love his poetry and I don't have a religion so I have to translate what everything religion means to him when he says God I have to translate it into something that I can try and understand so he has a poem called The Flower in which he describes himself as like a flower in that he tries to grow but periodically is sort of cut down by bad weather 
or the snow or whatever. So for me, reading that poem when I was a university student of 24, it was almost, I didn't notice it. I, I have the book where I ticked it off, I read it, I didn't, didn't take any notice, I wasn't interested. But reading it again at 42, after some hard, sad things had happened, I knew it was true that grief, though it is enormous and terrible, does melt away like snow in May. And, and you, so it wasn't that I didn't know it, I did know it, but it's as if seeing it in the words makes you know it in a more conscious or explicit way than, than before. So that's one kind of quite serious example. It has a lovely bit in that poem, and now in age I bud again. After so many deaths, I live and write. I once more smell the dew and rain and relish versing. Oh, my only light, it cannot be that I am he on whom thy tempests fell all night. So I think most adult humans, and certainly over the age of 50, would know whatever their educational experience, that life is hard and that it pummels you, but that something in you also can survive that. In England, uh, our project has been built by money from the National Health Service, not from education or culture. Um, we don't have any, how do you say, outputs, like exams. And it was after that group had been going for about a year that I began to realise that almost everyone in the picture has a health problem, physical or mental. Um, and depression, anxiety, um, physical illnesses such as heart disease, cancer, and so on and so forth, those diseases you know, I don't think there's one person in that photograph who, who is not unwell. But they didn't come because they were unwell. They came because we put up a sign saying, get into reading. Uh, but they stayed in that group, I think because some of what was offered made them feel better. Reading is often seen as a, a higher level activity for people who have been very highly educated. Reading of great literature. Yes, I suppose um, that's one of the aspects of the reading revolution I really, really hope is going to explode everything because um, great literature is for everybody. When, when a, a poet or a playwright or a novelist takes up their pen or writes on their keyboard, they aren't thinking about whether someone is educated. They are thinking about how it feels and what you think about being a human. And that's for everybody. So the problem, I think, is how do you get from being somebody who thinks, that's not for me, um, which many people have said to me, um, to thinking, actually, that is for me. His name is William Ernest Henley. Oh, very good, yes, Nelson Mandela. And this in the grey jumper is Linda. Those three people, Henley, Mandela, and Linda, are connected. They're connected by a piece of technology called poetry, a single poem, written by Henley in hospital after the amputation of his leg, read by Nelson Mandela during 27 years of incarceration at Robin Island, and read also by Linda in a Get Into Reading group. But Linda, you don't know her story, was a, a badly abused woman, violently beaten for many years by her husband, whose children had been taken away from her, and who was not um, literate, was not functionally literate. Um, our project worker read many poems with her and every week would say to her, do you like this one, Linda? And every week, Linda would say, I don't know. 
Don't know. Um, because she was felt uh, unable to make a comment on a thing. How do I know? Until she read this poem, when, when the project worker read to her, do you like this one, Linda? Linda said, yes, I like it. Um, I like the end. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I and the captain of my soul. A children's novel by the American uh, novelist Russell Hoban, he lived in England for a long time before his uh, recent sad death, uh, is called The Mouse and His Child. And it's a short children's novel, maybe aimed at children of about possibly 10, 11, 12. You can read it on lots and lots and lots of levels. And uh, to read it with a child is an utter, utter delight and to feel a world is opening up. But again, I read that with a, a group in which there's a moment at which the father realises they're broken and says, broken, the word was almost more painful than the thing itself. And, uh, and a man in, in the group I was reading in said, that's, that's true. Um, I, I have cancer, bowel cancer, and the word is, is worse than, you, you, do you dare to say it even? Um, and to think that from the, this little clockwork mice my, my story, a human can confide really in a group of potential strangers about some of the difficulties of his very adult life, um, but also, it sounds as if that's not connected to the story, but, but I think it is. And um, someone else in the, he said, he said something like, um, and to say, I'm dying, that's almost unsayable. Someone else in the group who, who uh, has a very, very bad stammer wanted to, just to say to him, we're all dying. <laughs> And you think, true, true, you know, turn the page. Yeah, shared reading and reading aloud. Um, hmm. I think th they are the same thing, except I suppose in reading aloud you might just read and not talk. I think in my mind it's also connected to what happens when I read as a solitary individual reader. Um, when I'm reading, say, The Mouse and His Child, I, I'm not always conscious and of everything that's happening in my mind as I read. But I do believe that a lot is happening in my mind as I read. Just like in real life, a lot's happening, and if you went to a psychotherapist, they would gradually make you realize some of the things that were happening that you weren't noticing. Um, so I think, in reading aloud, a parent or a, a good reader puts into their voice as much as they can of what they unconsciously maybe know that the story is meaning in some way. And I think what we've done in shared reading is make that more explicit. So you read it aloud, but you're consciously hoping to say to other people, does this set off a, a chime in your mind? Does a little bomb explode when I say this sentence? If so, say it, tell it. To, to, as the man said, I have cancer. This is me, some years ago, reading in a hostel for homeless men. And um, this guy in, in the stripes is just about 
to become a reader? The rule really is people do what they want. Um, and so you don't have to speak, you don't have to read. It's interesting to see how gradually people will read. Usually it is after they have in some way spoken. So the man who said about cancer read for the first time after he had said ab about having cancer. It was as if he had made some sort of bond of security by this confessional moment. Um, so this is uh, Calderstone's mansion in Liverpool. It's in the middle of a, a large public park. Um, the city have just given this house to the reader organisation and uh, we'll take possession of it in August and we're going to build there an international centre for shared reading. That's what we, we call it when we're reading aloud together. What, what's scary about developing shared reading on a large scale to be commissioned nationally as we aim to be in England or or to develop what we're going to develop here in Belgium, is that it's going to be very easy to codify certain skills. And I'm not sure that that's the best way to do it. I, but I don't know how else you can do things on a large scale. So to me, the, the big issue is going to be about quality, the quality of the human interaction which it's very, very difficult to legislate for, as we already know from every other area of life. How do you make a good doctor? How do you make a good teacher? You can put a list of things, but, but they need plasticity, generosity. They're hard to tick.